folks. Take your seats. Uh, before we start, uh, I'd like to ask if is there a camera in the audience? Another important announcement is uh, that uh, next week, on Monday, uh, I will be in Washington, like I said last time, but our teaching assistant, Laura, will be holding a review session uh, in class. Okay, so on Monday, you have a review session in class, done by Laura. So please come. You have to start with this one. On Wednesday, the Wednesday class, is technically canceled, okay? but I like to say that the homework is sooner than usual on Friday, but it's due on Wednesday. So you can use that hour, you know, the extra hour, to actually work on that. Okay? And then the Thursday evening at 7 o'clock, the eve of the exam, okay? because the exam is on Friday, 7 o'clock. HSLH 100A, we will be having our last review session, and you can come to that with all your partners. Yes? Yes, the review, exam. Yes, the, review uh, the practice exam is going to be posted online Tuesday night. Okay? So you can have a look at that. Yes? Uh, all, the information is all posted online, you will need to so please check there for details. Yes. Monday and Wednesday, I will physically not be here at Irvine. So if you want to see me, you have to come from Washington. <laughs> <laughs> to DC. Okay, so I apologize for my absence, but there really is no other way I cannot cancel this. It's a very important meeting actually. Okay, folks, so this lecture is the last piece of information that will be served on the midterm. Okay? So next week, there will be no new information introduced. Next week is only about rehearsing and practicing. So today, the last piece of information, but a very important piece of information. Okay? It's all about protocols and the structure of your periodic table. So uh, please play, pay attention, because uh, this is going to be a Central part of the midterm, or a part of the midterm. Okay, so the um, the question we're trying to uh, address here is related to you know it's really an atomic question. If you look at this atom, uh, you know that the nucleus composed of protons and neutrons is kind of the core of the atom. That's the nucleus. It's the center of the atom. But where is the electron? Where exactly is the electron? The electron, as we have talked about it thus far, seemingly is floating around the nucleus. But what does that mean, floating around? That means it just sits here, sits there, sits there. Is there a particular path it takes, or a particular area that it occupies? This is a very important question. The question of where the electron is. And you'll see that where the electron is, have such, have such profound implications that we, we actually will be able to explain chemical functionality from it. So, this is a picture that, you know, if you, if you Google atom, then you get something like this. You see these orbits, and this supposedly is an electron that uh, I think is a nucleus. But as you, as you will see in two seconds, this is really not the way it looks. Okay? This is really not the way we understand atom is structured. Electrons don't go in circular paths like planets circle our sun. Okay, it's quite different. So that's where the similarity stops. So let's have a look. This is a nucleus. Okay, let's put it in the middle, and then let's just pretend that the atom is a one-dimensional object. Okay, meaning that I only consider one spatial coordinate x. And I forget about the y and z at this point. So this is one. This is basically the uh, space that the electron can occupy. It can be close or it can be far from the nucleus. Right? And I just also 
I'm, I'm going to assume that this here, this last point, is really the end point of the atom. In other words, I just convinced myself the electron cannot be beyond that point. The electron must be somewhere on this line. Okay? All right? So I also like to uh, find the location of the electron, knowing that the electron is not having all kinds of funny you know, jumps in its uh, probability distribution. Meaning that uh, if I put the electron like this, I would say that's a good solution. This is a good probability function of the electron. This probability function is smooth. It doesn't have a jagged shape. That's unlikely. Okay. The electron has a high likelihood to be here, 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 and then towards the edges, it disappears. Okay? Because at the end, I, what I just said, it doesn't exist beyond that point. So the probability here is zero, and it gets a little bit higher here, 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 and dips down here to zero. This is a beautiful function. This function satisfies my uh, initial premises. The premise that it should be a smooth kind of function, a smooth distribution, and that the probability of the electron being somewhere should disappear at the edges. This function does that. Right? So I said, this is a good function. This is a good description of where the electron can be. Now, this is also a good one. It also it disappears at the edges. It's smooth, okay, and it's not disjointed. It is a different kind of curve. But also, this curve fits nicely into this, this length here, the length of this line, where I say the electron can be. So this is also a good probability distribution. And I say here, two half wavelengths is one half wavelength two half wavelengths, and here's another one, three half wavelengths, okay, so this is also zero here at the edges, a smooth function that comes back to zero right here. So all these functions, these kind of wavy patterns, are good descriptions of the probability distribution of the electron, okay? Now I say, I say three half wavelengths because, because this looks like a wave, I, I'm going, going to call this a wave function, all right? The electron function looks like a standing wave. All right? This, these standing wave shapes describe very well the probability distribution of an electron. Okay? It fulfills my conditions. The conditions that it disappears at the edges and that it's smooth and not disjointed. So these functions are good, good descriptors. Okay? I also see that there's not one kind of function that I find. I find a whole bunch of them. Okay, so I find a whole bunch of wave functions, and I call these things psi. Because I feel this is a very special topic, and when special topics come to the fore, people tend to give them Greek letters. Okay? This is a Greek letter that means it's very important. And this N here is a label for how many half wavelengths you have. Okay? So the first one is uh, 1, the second one 2, and the third one 3. So I have a label here. This is the number of probable functions I can find, and it goes from 1, 2, 3 to infinity, because there's an infinite amount of these functions. I can add more and more waves. Okay, so this is really, this is a function, and a good description of the probability distribution of an electron in an atom. <coughs> However, I've made some pretty harsh assumptions, and that is that I demanded that the electron function should go to zero here and there. But that's probably not really true, okay? Because how can an electron just be stopping to be here and not be on that side? It's a little silly. It could be here. Maybe the probability is lower, but it's definitely not just a hard zero. And that's definitely true in reality. So you can solve that problem by making this edge here go away and stipulate that in infinity the electron should go to zero. The probability of the electron should go to zero because you cannot find the electron infinitely far away from the atom. Okay? Now, if you put an extra condition in there and you're a smart, a smart mathematician, you can come up with solutions. And this is what people find. They find, again, the same kind of trend. They find the function, the function describes the probability of finding the electron in the, in the atom. Here's the nucleus again. You see that if, if the distance is very far, the probability goes down, down, down. This is the first one. This is the second one. It makes one extra swing. But then at infinity, again, it goes to zero. And here, another swing, and so forth. 
So again, I have a wave function here, which has a label n, and the label n indicates what kind of solutions I found. All these solutions are good solutions, okay? Of probable descriptors of where the electron can be. Okay, now this n is what I call a quantum number. It is the label of that function. I call the thing a quantum number. Okay? It kind of quantizes which function is allowed and everything else is not. Okay, that's good. But uh, there's another very uh, you know, hard assumption I made, and that is that the atom was a straight line, a one dimensional object. It's not true, it's a three dimensional object. How do we deal with that? You have to bring it into the picture, for sure. But here we go. This is the atom, this is the nucleus. Okay? So far, I've considered only the distance away from the nucleus. Okay? The distance away from the nucleus. And I saw that along this distance, there is a wave-shaped kind of behavior of the electron. The electron distribution follows a wave kind of pattern. That's along this coordinate, if you wish. Okay? So that's the distance away. But that, in addition to the distance away, there's also the distribution on the circle, or the sphere. The sphere becomes larger and larger if this R grows larger and larger. Okay. So I know that this wave function has swings, goes up and down, there's a wavy pattern along this coordinate. What about this coordinate? What about this sphere? Is the wave function also having interesting wavy shapes from that, from that sphere? And the answer is yes, it has. Okay? We're not going to into the details, but because this is one coordinate, r, and this whole sphere, the shell of that sphere is described by two extra coordinates, okay? two extra dimensions. It's a surface, which has two coordinates. I find a total of three quantum numbers. This is a three-dimensional object. It has three coordinates, and along each coordinate it is quantized. That means it has three quantum numbers, n, l, and ml. Those are the names. This is the one we, all, we have already seen. It quantizes basically the behavior along this axis. And then there's two more coordinates on the surface S, and the quantum numbers corresponding to that surface are l and ml. Okay? So in each of the dimensions, the spherical surface S and the distance R, there is a wave behavior which is labeled by a quantum number. Okay, so this is the quantum number along the radial coordinate. These are the quantum numbers on the surface S. If you add them up, you get three quantum numbers. Okay? Now, this electron wave function, sometimes called an orbital if you take the modulus square of it, is defined by three quantum numbers. That's the first thing we have to try to understand. The electron distribution, which is described by a wave function, is a function that's labeled by three things, three quantum numbers. Because there's quantization in three dimensions. All right. Now, what do these quantum numbers look like? Let me show that to you. We've already seen one. N. Okay? So this is N, and that is called the principal quantum number. The principal quantum number. That's just its name. What are the values? Well, we've seen it already. It starts at 1 and runs to infinity. Okay? That's it. The number of indices is 1 because it's just N. Now, the second quantum number and the third are a little bit because they are not independent of the other quantum numbers. N is. N doesn't depend on anything, just a number. But L, as you will see, depends on N. The name is angular momentum. That makes sense. Angular means the angle on the surface, so that means something on the surface has a wavy pattern. And the, the, the wavy of the pattern is indicated by a quantum number L. Okay? It's called angular momentum. Its values, like I said, are not completely independent. They are 0, 1, 2, 3, an integer. 
start from zero, runs to a maximum number of n minus 1. So the maximum number of L depends on what n is. All right? We'll see a couple of examples of this. That means if you have a quantum number n, the corresponding L has n different L's. What does that mean? Well, let's say if n is 2, then L can be 0 and 1. It cannot be 2 because the maximum number is n minus 1, which is 1. So L can have only two values, 0 and 1. So for each n, the corresponding L, there's n possibilities for L. We'll write this out in a few moments. The last quantum number is called the magnetic quantum number. It has also to do with the quantization on the surface in a slightly different way. It has to do with actually with the orientation of this pattern that you make with L. Its orientation is very much dependent on N, on M, M L, sorry. Its values depend on L. So if L has a certain value, then there are several solutions from M L. They run from minus L in integer steps to L. Let me give you an example. Let's say L equals 1. If L equals 1, for that quantum number, there are three possible ML quantum numbers, namely minus 1, 0, and 1. A total of 3. There's a total of 3 if L is 1. The total of ML quantum numbers is 2L plus 1. If L is 1, 2 times 1 plus 1 is 3. Okay, so this is what we just did. There is 2 L plus 1 different ML values for each L. Okay, so you see these quantum numbers, there's three of them, but they are interrelated. N is independent. But L depends on N, and ML depends on L. Okay, now let's, let's, let's give these things some meaning here. You will see it all falls into place in a few moments. Okay, so let's look at a couple of wave functions. Remember, these quantum numbers are labels. Okay, so here's one. This is, bless you, here's a wave function with a certain n, and I'm going to set L and ML both to zero. If that is the case, then we speak of an s orbital. An s orbital always has spherical symmetry. Why? Because it doesn't have any quantization on the spherical surface. Because L and ML are both zero. That means there's no distribution on the surface. It looks like a sphere. Okay? So there's a 1s. You get a 1s if this n is 1. You get a 2s if this n is 2. All right? And then there's a 3s, and there's a 4s, and a 5s depending on what the number of n is. All of these are solutions. These are the solutions that are called the s -O. OK. Um, we'll skip this and skip to number two, the p orbital. The p orbital are wave functions. And typically, we speak of the word orbital if we take the square, the modulus square of the wave function. Then we typically use the word orbital. Okay. So what is it? Those are all the orbitals that have the value L equals 1. So if you have a wave function that has L equals 1, that wave function, if you take the modulus square of it, is called a p orbital. What does that look like? Well, first of all, there is not just one for each of these guys. There's three. Because if L is 1, that means that ML can have three values. There's three possible p orbitals, and those few orbitals have different orientations. Okay? So all of these have L equals 1. All of these look like, don't look like spheres anymore. They now have a wave pattern on the surface which makes them look completely different. They look like doubles. Okay? So because L is not 0 anymore, they look different. They have a different shape. So this is the primary shape of the orbital is defined by L. And the orientation of this shape, more or less, quote unquote, more or less, is defined by L. There's different values of ML. They define the different orientations of these shapes. These are not strict. I mean, I, I, it's not true that ML is always 
aligning things, but this is just a rough understanding. Okay. Okay. So let's look at orbitals that have. Now let's first see how many of these things there are. There are a total of two L plus one equals three or P orbitals. All of S. Okay. The total number of P orbitals equals three because a P orbital is always L equals one. Two times one plus one equals three. So you can have, for instance, two p orbitals, there's three of them. You can have three p orbitals, there's also three of them, four p orbitals, and so forth. Okay, L equals two is called the d orbital. What is it? Those are wave functions where the L label has the value two. If you take the modulus square, you speak of a d orbital. Okay, so if the L equals two, then ML can have even more value. It can have minus two, minus one, zero, one, and two, that's five. There's five D orbitals. There they are. Here they are for a situation when N equals three. So the three D orbital. There's five different flavors. See, they have very different shapes. The approximate orientation is defined by ML. The approximate shape is defined by L. Okay. How many do we have? Again, 2L plus 1. 2L plus 1. Since L is 2, 2 times 2 is 4 plus 1 equals 5. It's 5. Here are 5. Okay? So these plots that you see here is just plotting this thing. The modulus square of the wave function, that shape is what you see right there. That's it. All these things are wave functions. Possible solutions of the electron distribution. Okay? So the electron can be in all. It describes where the electron can be. It will be in these lobes. Exactly where the lobes we cannot say. But I can say that it's on it's on uh, it's very improbable that the electron will be there. It's very likely it will be in one of this, 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 or this. Okay? And it's unlikely that it sits in between, because in between there's a zero there. So that's what these plots tell you. They tell you what is the likelihood of finding an electron nearby a nucleus. These shapes tell you that. Okay, so let's, let's try to see if we can understand these systematics here with these numbers. Okay, so let's start with n equals 1. And if n equals 1, L can only be 0. Because the maximum number of L equals n minus 1. And if n is 1, maximum of L is 0. So it's 0. So when L is 0, ML is 0. And when ML is 0, you only have one orbital. <coughs> and that is called 1S. There's only one of it. OK. So let's go to N equals 2. N equals 2 has two values for L, namely 0 and 1, because L runs from 0 to N minus 1. If n is 2, n minus 1 is 1, so 0 and 1 are the two allowed values for L. When L is 0, one of the possibilities, then ML together will be 0. And if L is 0, we have an S orbital. There's only one S orbital. So, in addition to a 1 S orbital, there is a 2 S orbital. When L equals 1, you still have this guy, right? This is still for the value n equals 2. There's two possible values for L. Zero, we just discussed. One is the next. When it is one, there's three values for ML, namely minus one, zero, and one. When L equals one, we speak of a P orbital. That's the definition of a P orbital. L equals one. So this is P, called 2P, because the quantum number N equals two. This is a 2P orbital. How many are there? There's three. There's three 2P orbitals. Okay. Then we have exhausted all the possibilities for n equals 2. So we go to n equals 3. For n equals 3, there are three possible values for L, namely 0, 1, and 2. Right? For 0, again, ML is 0, and it is an S orbital. That's the definition of an S orbital. The definition is L equals 0. That's an S orbital. There's only one of us. So in addition to a 1S and a 2S, there is a 3S orbital. When L equals 1, again, I have three possibilities for ML. 
It's called a 3p orbital because I'm in the 3 shell. I'm in the n equals 3 shell. This is a 3p orbital. There are then 3. The last possible value for L when n equals 3, L equals 2. That's the last one. When L equals 2, there is 5 possible solutions for MF, namely minus 2, minus 1, 0, 1, and 2. That is called a 3d orbital. Why? That's the definition of a d orbital. When L equals 2, we speak of a d orbital. There's 5 of them. Okay? So here you see the, the list of possible orbitals when you ramp up the number you use all the possible allowed values of the quantum numbers. These are all the, these are the lowest energy orbitals that we have. And they follow, of course, when we go to n equals 4, n equals 5, and so you get more and more and more solutions. Okay. Now let's look at, so now we have defined these orbitals, but which orbital is the orbital of the lowest energy? That's important. Because the lowest energy orbital will be the orbital that is, that is occupied with high probability and higher energy orbital. So the lowest energy orbital is a 1s. And then the next is a is the shell where n equals 2. So n equals 1 is the lowest energy, n equals 2 has a higher energy. Both the 2s and the 2p have the same energy if you look at the hydrogen atom. Okay, so here's the hydrogen atom, the nucleus, the electron. Its lowest possible energy it can be in is in the s orbital, the 1s. The next lowest possible energy it can be in is the 2s or the 2p. They both have the same energy. And then, if you increase the energy even more, n equals 3, you see the 3s, the 3p, and the 3d all have higher energy than the, the, the levels in the n equals 2 level and the n equals 1 level. Okay? So here you see these lines. These lines indicate this red here is our, uh, the s orbitals. There's only one, but this is one orbital, one orbital, one orbital. For each p orbital, you have three solutions. So three 2p's, one, two, three, one, two, three. And the 3d has five. One, two, three, four, five. Okay? So each of these lines here, this, this line here, is a wave function with a label, okay? Two, one, let's say minus one. This can have three possible values. One, zero, minus one. Let's say this is minus one. This line here is one possible wave function. One possible set of quantum numbers. Okay. So, if I ask you what is the, where is the electron in the hydrogen atom? Well, I say, I say these are the possible locations the electron can be, it will be in its lowest energy state. So the electron will be in the 1s orbital. The electron goes in here and will basically sit anywhere spherically distributed around the nucleus. That's the answer. Okay? So for a hydrogen atom, the electron sits spherically distributed around the nucleus. That distribution looks like an s orbital. Lower possible energy. Okay, this is the hydrogen atom, which is not a very difficult atom because only it's one nucleus and one electron, or one proton and one electron. Okay, other atoms have multiple electrons. The next one over is helium, there's two electrons. So what happened there? Turns out things have indeed a little bit more complicated. As soon as you have more than one electron, the levels are slightly shifting because of electron-electron interaction. Okay? The 1s is still the lowest, followed by the 2s, but the 3p <coughs> is slightly shifted upward. It's no longer the same as the energy of the 2s. That is due to electron-electron interaction. Because you have multiple electrons that will shift things around a little bit. If you look at the third shell, where n equals 3, we had three different kinds of orbitals, the S, the P, and the D. In the hydrogen atom, they were all of the same energy. But in any other atom which has, which has more than uh, one electron, that's not the case. Okay? You see, the 3S is lower than the 3P, and the 3D has the highest energy. So, uh, 
you call this uh, the fact that these things have shifted, you call that that these edges are non degenerate. The degeneracy has gone, has been lifted. Hydrogen is the only atom where all the energies in the n equals 2 and x3 levels are equal, which means they are degenerate. Okay, so what is the consequence here? It's the following. The S levels have lower energies than the P levels, which have lower energies than the D levels, which have lower energy than the F levels. The F is the next one over, where L equals 3. Okay, so S orbital for any given N, for any given N, S lowers, followed by P, then D, then F, then G, and so on. Okay, so uh, here is a list of table actually. You see 1s, 2s, 3s, 4s, 5s, 6s, 2p, and so forth. This is n equals 2 shell, n equals 3, n equals 4, n equals 5, n equals 6. So what is the energy hierarchy here? I know that the 2p has a higher energy than 2s, and a 3b a higher energy than the 3p. Okay, so uh, the way in which these things are organized is as follows. Okay, the lowest energy is 1s, followed by the 2s, then 2p, then 3s, then 3p, okay, and then 4s. This is very interesting. Okay? The 4s energy is lower than the 3d. Okay? Then the 3d. 4p, 5s. So things got a little mixed up here. Okay? It's not true that everything that has a, you know, a, a 3 in front of it is always lower of energy than something that has a 4 in front of it. Okay? You see that 3d has a higher energy than 4s. In the same fashion, the 5s has a lower energy than the 4d. Okay? And so forth. So we can fill out this table like that. These arrows indicate how the energy is uh, organized in terms of the lowest energy and the highest energy level. So if you, can, if you can remember the first, I would say, seven of these, then you'll be in good shape. Okay, now, as we have done not enough, we're going to complicate things even more. And this is the last complicated. So we see that the distribution of the electron can be described by a wave function which has three layers of quantum numbers. There's possible solutions of these, and these quantum numbers are each of a layer, and you have certain values. And depending on these labels, the wave function has a lower or a higher energy. Okay? That means that the orbital has a higher or lower energy. Now this is the orbital, okay? The orbital the number, the quantum numbers describe the kind of the shape and the energy of the orbital. However, the electron that goes in it, turns out, the electron itself also has a quantum number. It's called the electron spin quantum. Alright? There's two possible quantum numbers, two values of the quantum number. It is plus half and minus half. And sometimes we call this spin up and spin down. So the electron spin quantum number is another quantum number, which is not a quantum number of the orbit orbital, but of the electron itself. It's two possible values, plus half and minus half. Now, one way to think about it is the following. The orbital is basically the three-dimensional space in which the electron can reside. And then the electron itself, in that space, can be either plus half or minus half. It's kind of the same as if you are driving in your car on the Orange County Highway System, let's say. The Orange County Highway System is described by three parameters, okay, X, Y, and Z. Those are the orbital quantum numbers. They define the space where you can navigate. And then in your car, you can be either, let's say, a boy or a girl. Two possibilities. Plus half minus. That would be the electric spin. Okay, so the driver behind the wheel can be either either of two things, right? And then that person then is driving in a three-dimensional space, which is labeled by three quantum numbers. 
So, but in the end, what we have is four labels, namely the first three, which are the orbital quantum numbers, and the last one is the electron spin quantum number. And the whole thing together is called the electron wave function. The electron wave function has four labels, three for space, and the last one for what's going on with the electron itself. Is it plus half or minus? Okay, now, here comes the person called Mr. Paul. And he was a smart guy. He thought about all these things a lot, and he derived through all kinds of difficult mathematics a rule. And the rule is the following. It says, in a particular atom, no two electrons can have the same set of quantum numbers. What does that mean? This is a wave function which describes a, an electron, right? There are no two electrons that have exactly the same wave function, which means there are no two electrons that have the exact same set of quantum numbers. They must have a different set of quantum numbers, which means a different wave function. So, there are no two electrons that have exactly the same wave function. It must be different. That's what the Pauli exclusion principle says. This is called the Pauli exclusion principle. Okay. So this is what I just said. Electrons in the same orbital have the same values for n, l, and ml. So they must have different values for ms. Okay, so what does that mean? That means that if I speak of, let's say, a 1s orbital, that orbital is defined by three quantum numbers. That means the first three are Taken care of. Let's say 1s has n equals 1, l equals 0, ml 0. I only have one quantum number left, which is ms. So if I put one electron in there, let's say it's plus half. If I put the second electron in there, it be minus half. If I put a third electron in there, I have a problem. I'm running out of possibilities. There are no other labels left. I exhausted all my possible uh, values of the last quantum number, which is only the two. Plus half or minus half. Okay, so this phrase here basically says you can only have two electrons in a whole Let's do that one more time. Here it is. Let's look at the theorem. Let's look at n equals 2, l equals 1, and ml equals 0. Here is an orbital. That's the orbital. That's the wave function. The modulus square of it is the orbital. How many electrons can occupy that orbital? All right, well, I can put one in there. But if I put one in there, I have to give it a quantum spin, an electron spin number. So let's say I give it one half. The second electron that I put in there, I must give a different quantum set, a set of different quantum numbers. That means that the only way to do that is by giving it another electron spin quantum number, because the first three are already set. That's this shape. That's the shape I want to put it into. Okay? So now I have two electrons that both occupy this orbital. Can I put another one in there? No, you can't, because I've exhausted all possibilities of the last quantum number. There are no other solutions left. If I want to put another electron in the atom, I have to choose a different orbital. That means I have to change one of these quantum numbers, but if I do that, I am actually looking at a different orbital. So the third <coughs> electron must go into a different orbital. Okay, so knowing this, let's look at the following situation. So this is what we just said. Only two items fit into one, into one orbital. One spin up, one spin down. That's the total set of possibilities. Here I have the hydrogen atom. We just looked at it. We concluded there's one electron in the one S orbital, the lowest possible energy orbital. That's the lowest possible energy situation, and nature likes, likes it that way. The way to, know, to, uh, to write that is 1s1, one, one electron in the 1s. This is called an electron configuration. This electron can be spin up or spin down, it doesn't really matter at this point. Let's hop to helium over here. There's two electrons. The second electron must be of opposite side. We call that these two electrons are paired. They have opposite spins. 
They both take the one orbital, the one s. The next element has three electrons. We just concluded the third electron cannot go into the same orbital. It must go to a different orbital. Therefore, it helps to the next lowest energy orbital, which is a 2s. So lithium looks like this. The electric configuration for lithium is 1s2, 2s1. Now look what happens. I jump from the first row to the second row right here. All right? You see, the H, the hydrogen, has one electron in the 1s. Lithium has one electron in the 2s. So they're kind of similar. That's why they sit right below each other. Let's go to beryllium. Beryllium has a total of four electrons. Three are already occupied. So the fourth one will go in the 2s because it's still placed. That fourth electron has to be of opposite spin to the one that's already there. Okay. Now, boron has five. That's uh, <coughs> number five. That means five protons, five electrons. Four are right here. That means that the fifth must go into the next available, which is the P. It actually goes into the P subshell. Okay, here it is. It goes right there. Now, before we continue, I want to. Uh, let you guys know that the 1s, the, one, the first row, is completely filled with electrons. We call that the core or closed shell electrons. Four electrons are the electrons that sit in a closed shell. n equals 1 is here. Okay? All the n equals 1 orbitals are occupied. The full. The 2s is still open. The 1s is filled, yes, but the 2p is still open. That's why this is called the open shell. We call those the valence electrons. Okay, so let's go to carbon. There's one more electron. Where does it go? Here or there? It goes to the next. That's a rule. It's called Hans rule. It says the maximum number of unpaired electrons is the lowest possible energy arrangement. If I would have put it right there, it paid a little bit more energy. I put it next to it. Lower. It goes into a different PO. Okay, so that is carbon. Nitrogen, same. Right there. So this is the electric configuration of nitrogen. Three electrons and a 2P. For oxygen, I have no choice but to pair up one of the electrons. Okay? Doesn't matter which one. Doesn't matter which one. It can be anyone. Let's start just uh, let's start right here. Okay? So this four means three are unpaired. The fourth must pair with one of them. And then we just start filling it up. F, put one more in. Okay, so that means one is unpaired, the rest are, is paired. And neon has all of them paired up. It has six electrons in the 2p. That means this entire 2p subshell is not filled. That means that neon has its entire n equals two shell filled with electrons. It is a closed shell arrangement. Okay, so this is n equals 2. It's filled now. That means the next element must be in the third row of the periodic table. Okay, that's a deep case. That is sodium. It is one electron in the 3s. You're going to have to write down this uh, orbital explicitly at this point. You can just do with this notation. One electron in the 3s. All the other ones are filled. Another way of writing this. Is the following. Neon, that was configuration right here, a closed shell arrangement. Sodium has the same configuration, neon plus one hexa electron in the three gas. So this is a good way of writing the electric configuration of sodium. Magnesium, same deal, just one extra electron in the three S. Okay, or neon, three S2. We can, hop, uh, we can go a little faster now. This is phosphorus. It has an electrical configuration of neon, 3s2, 3p3. All these three electrons in the subshell of the p, the p orbitals, are unpaired in phosphorus. Argon, on this end, has all the electrons fill up the 3p shell, the 3p subshell. That means that now the entire n equals 3 uh, orbitals, this whole set, is filled with electrons. That's why argon also has a close, close shell arrangement. 
very similar to neon and very similar to neon. That's why they're in the same line. Okay? So the imperial table really tells you the electron configuration of the elements. Can you see it once again? You notice that all these guys, well, this whole column here, all of the elements have one electron in a S orbital. Right? These next guys, beryllium, magnesium, and so forth, they all have two electrons in a S orbital. These guys here are all elements that have their last electrons in the P cell. <coughs> That's why they are related, and that's what I call the P elements, P block elements, and so forth. So we don't talk about this section right here. It's a little bit more complicated. All right, so I'm going to summarize very briefly. Remember the following. The orbits are not circles, OK, of these electrons, not circles. They're best described by a wave function. A wave function has very particular uh, properties. It is labeled by quantum numbers. The quantum numbers indicate which wave functions are allowed, which shapes are allowed, which shapes are good descriptors of where you like to be. Okay? So the electron function is called the wave function and is labeled with quantum numbers. The quantum numbers are related to each other. The allowed wave functions, the one with correct with the correct set of quantum numbers, if you take the modulus square of it, you call that an order. It really describes the distribution, the likelihood of finding an electron close to a nucleus. The distribution is described by the modulus square of the wave function. And only two electrons fit into one orbital. That is called Pauli's exclusion principle. Very important because that principle allows us to kind of derive the periodic state using these principles. The energy of the orbitals of a particular row in the periodic table goes like this. S lowest, then P, then D, then F, and so forth. Okay, and then the last thing we did is we literally kind of derived the periodic table by filling up those orbitals by putting an extra electron in there for each subsequent element. And we see if we do that, Beautifully retrieve the structure of the periodic table. That's why the S orbital column is only two wide, <coughs> only two electrons to fill the S orbital. The P block is six wide, because only six electrons fill the P orbital. The P, P, P orbitals, only two fit in there, two times three equals six. That block is six wide. This is why. All right, that's it. I'll see you on Thursday. Okay. Please go to class on Monday.